You know, and it's, it's like it's time. It's like if like if this music is the music of the future, which like okay, it, it, it hints at that, but really what I think it is, it's like so it's a music that's like the intellect and the body at the same time, and that's rare. That is very rare. So it's it's synthesized like a lot of different music forms into one, and it's like this kind of like meeting point of stuff. And I just find people that like really like to get down like the music. You don't have to know it. You don't have to know its history. You just have to hear it. music that is definitely enlightening, it's pushing the limit of technology, I mean, you know, it's it's definitely the future. It's like magical happens when you start to play with keyboards and drum machines. Electro is the science fiction of music. If the people that are kind of anti-new technology were around 30 years ago, Electro wouldn't have got started. We like sci-fi movies, we examine them, and we found out that this music was kind of related to that, and then we latched on to the whole craft work, robot type thing, it was like, wow, this is what we really into. people that hear electro is the better because the reason people don't like it is because they haven't heard it. And I heard this one tune, Hip Hop Bebop. All I remember was like just taking my um, boombox out and playing it to all my friends. I know you've got to check this out. Oh, it's just like the baddest, baddest music I've ever heard. Like, and it's sort of stuck in the scene. was a huge scene in Europe, especially in the UK where I live, you know? In the early 80s, there was a series called um, Electro Series on Street Sounds. I mean, every kid was out there who had a boombox, had those, had those tapes or those, those records and was breaking to it, and that was how it was really big at that time. I was 13 years old on the on the schoolyard break dancing, looking at the girls, trying to impress them, you know, with the with the vinyl stuff on the floor. For me, that was the start. Electro has has always been there for me. Electro was the music that basically got me started into this. As a b-boy, as a graffiti artist, then as a sound engineer, then a programmer. And then it died out. It died out for like. So sort of, about 85, sort of everyone sort of stopped it, doing it, hip hop. It, more it, sort of break, into sort of hip hop. Came, yeah. yeah. I think a lot of the confusion in this country is that that's what people think electro is only. They think that's what proper electro is because of that series. 
which covered mainly the hip hop and electro funk angles. People are saying a lot of the synth pop stuff isn't electro. This is like the model is electro pop, it's not electro funk or electro bass tune. Yet that's Kraftwerk. And to call Kraftwerk not electro is, well, it's a sin, basically. Baker, really want to thank those guys for basically making those marks in the music industry. The production one I listened to today, I mean, they were ahead of their time. There was no West Coast sound yet. The sounds of uh, New York, Planet Rock, I think it was Electric Kingdom, Twilight 22, those kind of sounds. I was a DJ at the time, and those kind of sounds were the main thing going through my mind when I went to the studio to make my songs, and also craft work, of course. I, I think that it doesn't become electro until... It leaves Kraftwerk and Arthur Baker, John Roby, and Africa Bambata put their spin and made Planet Rock. I mean, I think that's the beginning. That's the start of it. That's the first record. Before that, Kraftwerk, I say, like, proto-electro. Like, they're definitely the blueprint, but it changes when it becomes this, you know, American music form where it takes off in areas never really expected before. A 12-inch era. A 12-inch well, song would, you know, after Planet Rock, after Looking for the Perfect Beat, you would get an album's worth of ideas on these, like, electro 12-inches. Like, it, just in, you know, Egypt, Egypt. I mean, there's, like, it breaks down in the middle, has another song in it. I could have heard a, a bad edit go, oh, 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 like, oh, the record skip. But I took it and said, okay, I'm going to do this with it, make it be on beat. So Egypt, Egypt was, like, almost a mega mix of all these things that had in my head. And I put them all down on track. Electro scene never died. It was just there was not too many people doing that music anymore. But if you go to any club, any cabaret, anything in Detroit, when people start dancing and you got the whole crowd on the floor, it's going to be dancing to Planet Rock, Clear, Cosmic Rain Dance, Numbers by Kraftwerk, Luke, Egyptian Lover. Oh, people will get up. The steel. Detroit techno was kind of born out of, uh, I mean, it comes a little later, but it evolves out of this scene that was like this high school party scene where like in the late 70s, early 80s, people were doing like these themed parties, really hip high school kids. People really knew what was going on. And like, you have to go back in time. Well, see, like this, that, that I mean, that Charivari era, you know, it's like, it's really, you know, interesting to think about these high school kids that like, you know, they grew up with like their social conscious parents and stuff that like, were all into like, you know, soul music and Motown and this like, remembered thing. And these kids wanted to make something new that was for them, that was their generation. It's like, every music form begins as like, generation gap music, like intentional, intentionally alienating my parents' music. At the time you had Juan Atkins, Eddie Folks, Kevin Saunderson, Jeff Mills, you know, all playing at the same party. That's the roots of Detroit techno. Go more synthetic, bring in more European influence, everything that would be counter to what your uh, uh, parents would want, I guess, or expect for you to do. Though there is direct soul music influences 
all throughout Detroit techno. It's just that original era has that, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like this rebellious attitude, but you can feel like the direct influence. Black science fiction music from a decaying urban center, from a place nobody ever expected the new technological advanced music form to come from. You couldn't blame it all on Detroit techno, but it was like largely the spark, and you can see it, its influence in, uh, directly in so many of the popular subgenres that exist today or throughout the 90s that spread the music around. Derek May and Kevin Saunderson's specific sounds changed the way people were making music in England, Belgium, and Holland. Instantly. Germany kept on with its like kind of EBM industrial dance thing, but in those places the music started to shift and change. And it's changed from new beat into this kind of rave music that brought some really exciting music. Did it predict future pop culture? Did it predict what the Neptunes would do? Did it predict how techno, R&B, and hip-hop would become? It needs to be said that it's quite Detroit influenced, at least it was in the beginning when we uh, released the uh, Lucky Bastards and other side. I think Keith Tucker has done some wicked stuff over the past, it's just been relentless. So. The groups that I'm really inspired by and the groups that I'm really into, I would definitely say are mostly stateside, like Underground Resistance, Drexia, uh, Doctor Effect. You know, thanks to groups like Drexia and Doppler Effects and all those Detroit guys, they really did keep the, the ball floating, do you know what I mean? It's not wrong when people say, like, yeah, Detroit, that's where it started because this is where it changed. You know, if Africa Bambata was the person that made Kraftwerk Electro, then we're definitely the spark that changed the Chicago idea, which was a change of the New York disco idea. We're the spark that altered that, that made it so it could take off in... Europe. As good as techno is, it, it did really get in the way of electro, and I think people now are suddenly realizing that the best parts of that were electro, really. There's a, a lot of electronic history in the UK that was like Cabaret Voltaire and Ultravox and Human League, they were doing stuff in the early 70s, uh, experimenting with synthesizers which was kind of like later developed in Detroit. They kind of had the same thing going on, but it was like 10 years later. It was, it was all going off in, even in those days, like New Order, when they did Blue Monday, the engineer for that was um, Michael Johnson from the Johnson Crew, things like that. Russi did uh, Time Zones, uh, Wild Style. So that was like part of his Arge record, and you know, most people think of that as a real true b-boy tune. It'd be good if uh, that kind of scene progress again today. I think that's another really important thing is to you know to understand the future you've got to understand the past so you should be able to you know at least respect the past. More importantly you know it's just music at the end of the day and, and that's what you know the whole thing is about be it you know electro, techno, house, dub or whatever you know it's just a, a feeling. And You've got like electro techno, you've got electro disco, you've got electro funk, electro hip-hop, electro rock, you have the, the new wave, you got the, the electronic ambient scene, electro pop, everything. It all stems from one thing. All those styles are electro. And there isn't actually a real electro. Electro is just, it's not a style of music, it's a way of making music. Electro is not a kind of music, it's a way of approaching a kind of music. And that you do that with electronic gear.
analog synths just fit that kind of science fiction fantasy. They look like your science. They look like the set of science fiction movies. Also, we started just like exper experimenting with yeah. everything we got. We didn't do anything about the studio yeah. technique or recording or anything. Yeah. We, just, we just did. Started doing. I think we were supposed to turn in some new songs for Sight Beyond Sight, and we turned in the wrong tape. We just turned in our electro stuff, and that's when Direct Beat heard it and said, "Oh, wow." We didn't know you guys do this. At that time, that's what we thought everybody was doing, tweaking and adding. And the time when Metroplex was still forming, we'd sneak over and watch wine and stuff from the cars. We'll go home and be like, man, I got to do this and come out with all these different sounds and everything. Keith would spend time on the sound like for weeks. So you can imagine I'm writing lyrics, he's spending time on sound, other guys doing beats, and when you would come, you get this big bass gumbo ghetto stew. A lot of people in the neighborhood thought we were all kind of like strange, nerdy type guys, because we was listening to this strange music. And then when certain groups like us and Drexia and Detrekno came out and started doing stuff, it was best to not even tell people who you were. Because as soon as they heard the tracks, it's like, oh, it's hot. They playing it on the radio and everything. But as soon as they find out it was a little local group or whatever, it's like, ah, oh, it's okay. You know, so we had, I think that's how the whole underground thing kind of um, kept evolving from what Kraftwerk did. Keep low key, don't say nothing, just keep it like, you know, you know, you don't even see the, what the group looks like. You don't know who's in the group. Bring the drum machine to the dances and, um, Playing the drum machine live and playing records on top of it. Sort of like with the same thing that happened with house music, how those guys were playing nine on nines with the beats. We were just doing it with electro beats and really hadn't even heard that they were doing that. We just thought it was just something to add to the party. And a lot of people were saying, um, Where can I buy that record? So I was like, mm, I don't know. Um, let, me, let me research that. And man, I remember Reckless at the time. That was the song. And we programmed the beats exactly the same. And then people would say, wow, was that a special record? Because the beats, you know, we didn't hear the rest of the keyboard parts. It was just beats. Yeah, so I went to a couple of studios and found out how much it cost per hour and kind of recorded it on my own. So it was kind of like a blind venture going into it. But it worked out pretty good. Our um, shows consisted, when we first started, of a Dr. Rhythm, a core DDD5, um, all CZ 101s. Everybody had Casios. Now that's the awesome board to use. I mean, you, you know, toy just a little toy then, you know, and um, speak and spell. strings. Yeah, we used speak and spell back then. We were getting those sounds that people were trying to get now out of those synthesizers. Plus, it was low budget. I was always trying to discover where they had this warm sounds. Anyone watching this or anyone hearing this who, who knows what it's like to be in a studio just knows that something magical happens when you start to play with keyboards and drum machines. Well, my idea that I have in my head when I make a track is always basically to, to go in, start off with some rhythm patterns and then basically, you know, build up from that. But the uh, first step and the main step is always work on the rhythm, you know, uh, the rhythm is very important, I mean, this is what's going to get the people moving, everything else that you add is just basically, you know, um, it's the identity of your track, but the rhythm is very important, and the sound of the rhythm, and, and just trying to get all that organized, is the most important process for me anyway, to make my music. I don't turn on a machine and mess about and think, that's amazing, I think that's an easy way out, I think that's, that's the machine making the music. I mean, I use machines to make music, I love machines, but the idea is the most important thing. Sometimes you sit down and think, right, okay, we're going to do this kind of track. But you only need to flick of a switch, that's what I love about electronic music, at the flick of a switch, press of a button, click of a mouse, you can take, you can go, you can end up at the end of the, you know, at the end of your studio day, somewhere totally different than where you started, that's, that's the joy of it. There was a tendency to it be more separate that they would have engineers, they'd have a producer, they'd have the ideas, but they'd work with engineers and producers. So I think it was hard to get the full artistic, kind of a real personal message across if you've got to do it through an interpreter, through an engineer or a producer, whereas now there's more and more people that can do it all themselves. To me, the technical side is creative now. It's all totally blurring together. If you can take a plastic box and wire it via your heart and soul and your feet and make a record, you know, that, that's how I judge. To me, good electronic music is, is, is music that uses the process to produce something soulful rather than just sitting there being interested in the, you know, the, the, the new computer program and sound manipulation. I mean, it's important, but, but the end result and communicating with people is, is, is the most important thing. You know? It's using that process. Computers, they're, they're, they're just plastic boxes, they're there to be used. 
Necessary evil, right? They rule for recording. For that, it's kicks like a dat machine. Uh, I used to be totally analog guy for years. Now I've been on a total digital bender for the last four years. But I just love working on the computer. I love that intense, the cleanness of it and the kind of intensity of it, the sharpness of it. We haven't used computers too much, although the kind of the, the myth that we don't ever use a computer is I think everyone's kind of coming to realise that that can't be completely true, which it isn't. And it's an area that we do want to move into. Uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, we want to get into this crunchy, glitchy kind of sound. But at the same time, retaining you know the, the punch and the warmth of the analog stuff. I wish I was good enough at writing software to make my own plugins and make my own software. I mean, there are some people doing that. No, soy tampoco un defensor de batallas. Usar solo hardware, usar solo software en el estudio, puedo usar lo que me motive en ese sentido. Pero bueno, quizás me llega mucho más la máquina, me llega mucho más el hardware.